Um, uh, Sam and Sam, I'm sorry to get you <laughs> that first time. Would you like to come up again? I'll, I'll, I'll reread what it's all about. <clears throat> Sam Lang helped lead the establishment of the Quorum Sense Extension Project, bringing his diverse farming science and leadership experience to support the growing grass, uh, grassroots farmer network. And Sam Hogg, over the last five years, has spearheaded Mingaroa Farms' transition from high-input degenerative farm systems to a low-input regenerative organic system. He's also uh, <coughs> diversified the farm, incorporating organic vegetables into the regrassing rotation. Sam and Sam, congratulations. Thanks, John. Uh, kia ora koutou. You get two Sams this morning for the price of one. Um, and we're going to have seven minutes each, so keeping it super tight. Um, I'm going to cover off uh, a bit about quorum, who Quorum Sense is and what we do, and then hand over to Sam, who's going to give a more practical example about what some of this change actually looks like on farm. I'll just set up our wee timer. So, who's Quorum Sense? Um, we're a bit different too. Uh, we're not a catchment group, but we're a national farmer network uh, focused on grassroots farmer to farmer knowledge sharing. Uh, we cover all sectors and regions throughout the country um, and have quite a lot of practitioners and scientists and other people involved as well. Um, group kicked off in 2018 as a voluntary and formal group um, out of Leeston. Uh, grew quite quickly. Uh, our mission is generating and sharing practical knowledge to support regenerative farm systems in vibrant rural communities. Uh, size is a bit hard to pin down. Uh, we don't really have a formal membership and engagements like sort of on a spectrum. Um, got a few hundred farmers engaged in local discussion groups and come to events and field days and stuff like that. Uh, and then there's kind of the number of farmers engaged online in some forms in the thousands, but um, that's pretty hard to put a finger on. And you've got a charitable trust structure. So um, at the moment there's eight board members, five of them are commercial um, farmers, and then there's sort of bit of science and business and stuff in there too. I uh, thought I'd cover off uh, 45 seconds on what is biological and regenerative farming. I usually do this in about an hour. Um, so I guess first and foremost, it's not really something that's defined by us or our community, uh, and there's not a huge amount of interest in doing so. Uh, this is kind of my brief take on it, not necessarily representing everyone else's views, but I see regenerative as basically the outcome. So we're thinking about people, profit, soils, animals, water, climate, etc. Pretty much the same as all the conversations that have been going on the last couple of days. Um, and the belief that we can actually improve all of these outcomes together at the same time without having to make these big compromises, you know, environment for profit um, or people for environment, for example. Uh, biology and ecology is the mechanism. So developing a deep understanding of how nature functions and looking to optimise our farm systems to enhance those ecological processes that are driving the health and the productivity and the resilience of our farms. Um, mindset's a word that gets um, used quite a lot and kind of underpins the success of these transitions. So this is kind of like, think of it as farmers embedding these new understandings of how, um, well, uh, yeah, uh, embedding these new understandings of those ecological principles and working with them uh, and developing regenerative systems. I guess the key to that is like, instead of just, it's not just a planning, but this kind of mentality needs to be embedded in your everyday actions, and that's where the mindset piece comes in. It's the small things that add up, add up to big change. And finally, practice is guided by principles, not rules. Um, so most practices can have a place, and again, it's about the outcomes. It's not necessarily how you get there. Uh, so yeah, in that context, um, what does Quorum Sense actually do? Uh, we do a lot of regional events, field days, and network support's a big part of it. So uh, we started off driving a lot of events and field days ourselves. There was a big sort of, the initial surge was kind of based in Canterbury. Um, we're now focused on supporting over eight sort of regional groups and that number's increasing around the country. Uh, and similar to many groups trying to support groups in a way that they can kind of become independent and self-sustaining and not dependent on us securing funding long-term to, um, to lean on. Uh, digital connectivity has been a really powerful and low-cost way of facilitating farmer-to-farmer -farmer knowledge sharing. Um, using things such as Facebook and WhatsApp. Um, culture is really important in that space and creating safe online spaces where you know, there's no fear of judgment, we can encourage curiosity and questions. Um, and we're looking to develop new spaces for that um, that are more suited to what we're trying to achieve there and where Meta is not selling your data. Um, positive storytelling is a big part of it. So 
uh, things like case studies, podcasts, social media. Um, the focus of these tends to be on the inspiration and the ideas, keeping people's energy up and keeping them excited, uh, with a secondary focus on that practical how-to information. Um, and we also, uh, a lot of online knowledge sharing, so that's through things like webinars, case studies, and we've just launched a new community knowledge hub. Um, and the focus there is on that practical how-to information, but in reality, there's a lot of that information and ideas and stuff that's sort of crossing over and cross-pollinating. Um, most of the information that's being generated by farmers, so our job is basically collating and compiling and, and, and presenting it back. Um, and where there's scientific data that exists, we're trying to sit, sit that alongside and complement it. Um, something that's growing for us is sort of research and extension. So um, our role there is primarily facilitating greater farmer engagement in the design, monitoring, implementation, management of research programs. Um, and that's kind of bringing farmers in to do that job and then we've got a sort of um, a role there in doing the extension better than um, your traditional science um, scientists would do. Uh, this image is from uh, down in Southland at a field day we held a few months ago, uh, which is a partnership between the dairy farmers, Ag Research and Quorum Sense. So Ag Research have a trial there with the dairy farmer uh, looking at hay bale grazing um, for anyone that's seen that as an alternative wintering strategy. Uh, successes and learnings. Uh, there's been plenty of those. Uh, I suppose the biggest one is we've created a, um, a sense of community and a support network for the farmers that are moving in this space. Uh, like anything new, being a first mover can become a pretty lonely place. There's lots of stories of that um, through other first mover things in the past. Um, but yeah, building that sense of community, that shared identity and support has been really powerful for helping farmers through that initial learning phase and the inevitable challenges that come with that. Uh, we've also had really um, good feedback from our surveys that were done recently in terms of you know, the evidence that actually a lot of what we're doing is translating to on-farm change in a positive sense, and that the farmers that are working engaged in quorum sense, they're more excited, they're less worried, and importantly, they're actually doing a lot of sharing of information and knowledge and learnings and stuff with other farmers, um, you know, not necessarily mediated through us, which is awesome. Um, and we're really excited about that steady growth of those farmer-led discussion groups around the regions. Um, we've also witnessed a lot of cross-pollination of knowledge and ideas between sectors. Um, so that's been a real strength of um, the diversity of our network, and that's seen some really big leaps in practice in some areas. Arable farmers you know, sharing some stuff on drilling and establishment and stuff with pastoral farmers and vice versa on grazing management, for example. Um, a huge amount of this as I said earlier, has taken place online in this knowledge and support transfer, and that's not definitely not for everyone, but for those that are, that are into that, it's an extremely effective and low-cost way of um, being engaged and um, kind of on that everyday and every week basis. Um, and we've now got a pretty decent diversity of podcasts, um, webinars, case studies, and the Knowledge Hub there that's becoming a, um, increasingly becoming a place that fills a knowledge gap around this that previously um, kind of wasn't really filled by um, any other organisations. So hoping by the end of this current funding round we'll have a, um, a pretty decent um, repository there. Uh, in terms of challenges, this is the shortlist. Um, yeah, having a broad focus, so this sort of national multi-sector, multi-regional approach definitely comes with um, many strengths in terms of that cross-pollination of knowledge and ideas, but it also makes it quite difficult to identify and prioritise where we deep dive, um, and it's that constant tension between breadth and depth. Uh, similarly, the, the diversity of practice, um, there's plenty of um, you know, media commentary around what region is and isn't, um, don't tend to pay too much attention to it, but um, even within a sector in a region, the, the way that farmers actually decide to run their systems towards these goals can be extremely different, and so um, I guess our job is to make sure that we showcase multiple approaches so there's never one perceived right way of doing things. Um, and that's a really positive thing, but it's, um, it can be a challenge. And speed of growth, we went from an informal local discussion group um, to a you know, half million dollar a year extension project in less than two years with all the governance and set up and everything that comes with that. So um, many in the room here are familiar with the growing pains that are associated with that. Um, and obviously COVID curveballs made it pretty difficult, especially around the in-person events and planning. Um, I'll just let you read that, read those notes really, just gonna hand over to Sam, who's um, yeah, uh, dairy farmer up in the Manawatu and one of our most recent board members and up to some pretty cool stuff and hopefully 
um, that just gives you a bit of an idea about kind of what this can look like practically on farm. Kia ora koutou. Uh, thank you very much for having me today. It's an absolute privilege to be sharing our regenerative story on Mingrao Farm. Um, just a little snippet of it today. So we're a sixth generation family farm. Um, most our history, oh, excuse me. Oh, let me go back one. Most our history was um, sheep and beef and um, my parents had a small snippet at organic market gardening in the early 2000s, um, before their time, sadly. Um, and in 2008, we decided to convert to dairy farming. Um, we got caught up in the gold rush and like, like a lot of people, we thought, you know, production was the answer. So we, in terms of inputs, you name it, we had it. And we did definitely push the production, but we also pushed our land greatly. And um, we started to see the, the effects of this on our, on our farm. And also through the uh, 2014 and 15 dairy downturn, we saw you know, huge financial effects. So dad wanted, got us together as a family following this and um, said, you know, what are we doing? Where are we going? How do we want to farm? And we, we wanted to farm in a way that we were proud of. We wanted to farm in a way that was regenerating our, our environment. We wanted to you know, farm in a way that was profitable, a farm that we could, we could, we could control our costs and we're, we're not just crossing our fingers for a high commodity price, essentially. Um, so we looked around and we were like, right, so this is what we want to do. What, how do we do this? And um, there's a few farms that were regenerative organic and they were just ticking all the boxes in terms of people, planet and profit. Um, and had super low cost input systems, the, the pastures were looking super healthy, the cows were content, they were still, still highly productive and we just thought that was amazing. So this was the direction that, um, that we headed down. Um, and now, so what that's meant on farm for us, so practically we've dropped our cow numbers 30% um, and trying to work out what, you know, how, how effectively creating self-contained system. There's not a lot of um, organic supplementary feed available and we didn't want to have to rely on that. We wanted to control our system and know, I guess, the, the, the externalities of, of our farming practice fully. Um, we eliminated palm kernel, eliminated winter cropping, replaced urea with nat natural fertilizers. We weren't looking at getting rid of fertilizers, but we wanted to use fertilizers that enhance the soil bi biology to function at its, at its potential. Um, and incorporating plant diversity across the farm, across a, a large portion of the farm. We're, we're now at half the farm. Um, and a key component of this um, with, with these plant uh, diverse pastures was increasing our rotation length and um, increasing our covers. Now, I'd be lying if I said it wasn't, wasn't a challenge. Um, I, I was very naive going into it and thought, you know, we do the right thing and the right thing will happen. It'll, it'll, our fortune will come to us. And that, that was not true. Um, it takes time to, to, you know, reawaken your soil and it takes time to, to reawaken the innate immune system of a, of a cow. Um, so it took a lot of patience, certainly for a young person that just wants it now. Um, we had two brutal droughts in our first two years and that was just like, wow, okay, we're trying to work out how many cows our land can actually handle you know, is this, is this a baseline or is this, is this, you know, just an anomaly? So that was a huge challenge and that was obviously led to, you know, often a, a massive production loss through eliminating those, you know, 30% reduction of cows, but also that. Um, and then the bank through it all, we had massive financial pressure and they, they were tough on us, they were really tough on us. And, and, and I, I don't blame them, like, you know, on our financial metrics, we weren't in a great state and looking at, conventional metrics or, you know, where a farm's going, what it's doing, um, it's, you know, we, things weren't looking positive, yet on the ground what we were seeing, we were seeing our cows getting healthier and healthier. We were seeing our soil just, just looking like improving by the, you know, by the season, our pastures improving by the season. And so we were still, um, I guess, you know, so energised by the fact that we knew that we were moving in the right direction. We knew that that, that we, would, we would get there and we, we made the right move. So, um, and um, last season was actually our most profitable since converting to dairy farming. And now that's with 40% uh, less animals than our absolute peak and approximately 30% less cost. So I think, you know, that it's just that it's profitability. It's not, it's not production. Um, we've had massive reductions in our empty rates. 
um, as I've noted, about the, the health of our farm, improving um, our, you know, on Fonterra's numbers, our per nitrogen surplus is negative 12.75, which, you know, you, you, some people might think, well, that's, that's impossible to be a productive farm with um, operating like that. We're, we're growing, last year we grew 14 tonne of dry matter per hectare, so it's not, again, it's not an unproductive farm. We, um, within that system, I, you know, I see a surplus of nutrients in a dairy system. Um, You've got your effluent you're capturing, and I could see veggies marrying in really well with that system. So that's what we've done. We've grown minimal input organic vegetables within that system, and that's just been um, amazing to see, like the, the potato yielding, say, yielding 35 tonne of potatoes uh, with, with zero nitrogen. Um, and Dad's grown potatoes for years previous to our conversion, and um, he just, you know, he, he couldn't achieve that without significant inputs. Um, it's less stressful. It's a much more resilient system in terms of compliance for us. Like it's not. It's just not a cons not a concern. Um, we're uh, on my figures. So I, I worked out energy in, energy out. We're we're, we're putting um, one calorie of fossil fuel inputs into our system for 7.3 calories out. That's um, compared to I think average globally. We're looking at what 10 10 in for one calorie of food out, um, and. Off our 240 hectares, we're nine people per hectare. If, that, if I extrapolate that across croppable land across the globe, we're looking at 16.8 billion people, which um, we're at the absolute you know, tip of, I think, what, what we can achieve in terms of what we can grow off our land. We're not even using you know, barely any vertical space in the form of trees um, along, along sides of fences and whatnot. Um, so, I wanted to leave you with this quote, and um, I mean, there's no doubt that we are, you know, we're, that's why we're here today, because we're concerned about our environment, and we want to do the best by, by it, but we still want to, you know, we, we want to make a profit, um, and I think that regenerative agriculture provides such a, you know, such an amazing solution, um, or raft of solutions to these problems that we're talking about today, and it's certainly something I've witnessed firsthand on my farm, and um, as an organisation, Quorum Sense is seeing, you know, day by day, the farmers that are, are really just, it's just lighting the fire up in their bellies again. Um, and we, I mean, no one has all the answers and we're all still learning, but, um, but um, it's an enjoyable learning curve and, um, and, and we're in it together. So, thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sam. And Sam, what a great story. Um, I hope the world population doesn't get to 16 billion, because <laughs> it'll be double what it is now. Um, but wow, what a, what a turnaround.